Welcome to Overcoming Distractions. This is the place where adults, entrepreneurs, and busy professionals who might be a little distracted grab knowledge, inspiration, and encouragement to get focused, overcome obstacles, and thrive in business and in life. If you are an adult with ADHD, you are in the right place. But don't worry, because all types of brains are welcome. If you feel distracted at times and want the tools to achieve more in life, thrive in business, and learn a little bit more about yourself, come on in. Each week, a new expert in the field of performance, productivity, focus, and being true to yourself shares their knowledge and tips. And of course, adult ADHD. You'll always walk away with action items you can use. Ready for another engaging expert discussion? Here's your host, author of the best-selling book, Overcoming Distractions, Dave Greenwood. Hey everyone, welcome back to Overcoming Distractions. It is Dave once again, and I'm excited about this podcast as I am for uh, quite a few coming up because we've got some really cool guests. But this week we have Hacky Reitman back. He's Dr. Hacky Reitman. Uh, he's the founder of Different Brains, and you can find them at differentbrains.org. And he was on the podcast several episodes ago, and he is just a joy to chat with. And this time we're talking about why feel-good stories can actually, how they improve our mood, uh, how they make us feel better. And I was prompted by a blog that Hacky wrote on Different Brains about a gentleman by the name of Hunter Whitrock. And Hunter is a young man with cerebral palsy who trained for several months to be able to walk across the graduation stage. And his story, as they say, quote unquote, went viral um, because it was just so inspirational. And I contacted Hacky because he wrote a blog not only about Hunter, but about what it does to the brain when we see these stories. And in the times of coronavirus and all the other things going on in our world, um, we need a shot to the brain to make us feel a little better and improve our mood. So we're going to talk about Hunter Whitrock. We're going to talk about what we think was going through Hunter's head. Uh, in terms of did he do it for himself? Did he do it for others? Uh, we're going to talk uh, with Hacky about why we need these stories in our lives and how we can actually create uh, these stories for ourselves on a regular basis to make sure that we kind of keep our head above water. Um, as always, if you like the podcast, I'd love for you to hop on Apple Podcasts, give us a review. It is always helpful and always appreciated. You can find Overcoming Distractions, the book, at uh, Amazon as well as Barnes & Noble. And you can actually walk into a Barnes & Noble if you feel like going in and getting the physical copy. And um, if you like what you read there, I'd also love a review on Amazon. So anywho, uh, OvercomingDistractions.com is where you can find me, all the podcast episodes and other resources. So let's go talk to Hacky. All right, everybody, we're back with Dr. Hacky Reitman. How are you, Hacky? Great. Good to see you, David. Yeah. I don't know. People can't see us, but good to see you as well. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad you came back, and we're going to talk about why I actually contacted you um, recently. But uh, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little introduction um, of different brains because I think it's a tremendous – website and resource for people who, as we say, are neurodiverse, ADHD, autism, and beyond. Um, there's tons of educational stuff on there, uh, tons of experts that you have, um, and, and just a great place to, to lose yourself for a little bit and learn about your own brain and maybe your family. But tell me if I got that wrong. No, it's right. Uh, it's uh, autism, Alzheimer's, and all brains in between because we're uh, uh, all of us have a brain that's a little bit different. As my daughter taught me, uh, they're like snowflakes. No two are alike. And uh, we're trying to get in all the different silos. We have mental health over here, and you have 
neurological over here and you have developmental and learning differences here. And it's all part of the same spectrum of sorts. Yeah, yeah. It is a tremendous resource. You, you guys have so much content on there that, that uh, I, I'd have to say you probably have the most content for us different brains than any place well, on, on the planet by far. So um, for those listening, you know, just, and, and we'll put this in the show notes, but it's just differentbrains.org. Go there, check it out. There's something for every kind of brain. So, um, you know, with that being said, we're, you know, I back a few months ago, I started telling people when we were doing this podcast that, you know, for your reference, we're, we're recording this in the COVID-19 era, but it seems to not be stopping or we continue, we're going into four months of this COVID-19 era. And I think we're going to be in this for a while. So I'm just going to stop saying for your reference, we're, <laughs> we're doing this in the COVID-19 era. But with that being said, how have you guys adapted uh, what you do, how you do it? Well, um, I've always been a firm believer, and it's coincidentally, we just finished this, a virtual staff meeting, and I end the meetings with that I really believe. In life, you take a bad break and you try to turn it into a good break. We're trying to take this coronavirus times and turn it into a good break. How do we do that? Well, we've actually expanded our mentoring program for our neurodivergent interns. Mm -hmm. I recently spoke at Boston University and Stanford University, and they were scheduled to be live talks, but in these coronavirus times, they got changed to virtual. And guess what? We've now gotten interns from Boston and interns from California. And when you had to come into our office, you couldn't do that. Well, now we're doing it. And now we have more and more remote interns and we're expanding in a way. Um, we're trying to reach more people. We also have expanded our meetings. So I just now got off a staff meeting that while we get a lot of work done, it's almost like a social meeting. You know, it's like getting out and hanging out with nice people. Um, then once a week, we also have a social meeting with all of our interns and team where everybody kind of tells how things have been doing. And then we'll, uh, we'll sometimes we'll play a game and sometimes we'll just talk about different articles we've read. So I really believe that if you, if you try to stay on an even keel and you try to maintain the things that are good for your brain and your overall body, which it's not brain surgery, no pun intended, but you have to eat a good diet. You got to get out and breathe fresh air and go for a walk. You got to get exercise. Yeah. You have to have a full dance card. You have to have something to look forward to. Like David Greenwood's podcast. You gotta yes, be see? To, you know? <laughs> Thanks for that plug. <laughs> but, but you're right. We've had to kind of change the way we've, you know, I, I'll admit it the first couple of months, I might have had an extra beer on a Tuesday night. And <laughs> it, it, it's just, and you're like, okay, we're going into three months now. It, it's not an excuse anymore. You know, this isn't, you know, not every night of the week is the weekend. <laughs> and, well, a shift of gears I, I try to teach too is look, plan on making this great because plan on it not ending yeah. and then be happily surprised when it ends because right now nobody can tell you any definite anything and just all want to stay healthy and safe and everything and try to do as much as we can. The other thing that really makes you feel good is if you have the opportunity to help somebody else, which you do for so many people with all that you do. Yeah. And, and thank you for that. I've, I've actually really tried to buckle down the past couple of months and make sure that I get something out every week. Cause I know people need it. Um, whether they just need to, to get away um, you know, we're not always talking about ADHD. Um, we're talking about other things. I, I, I did uh, a podcast a couple of weeks ago about pivoting in your career because I think a lot of people either need to um, or they decided they're going to during these past few months is they're going to, you know, the, the new kind of phrase is, is pivot. But some, some people have said, you know what, now is the time for me to really do what I've really wanted to do. So, um, 
so yeah, so it's it's important for me to keep this up as well. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So so I contacted you because you wrote a blog about a gentleman by the name of Hunter Whitrock. Um, and, and I've watched the video as well. Um, but tell me, and, and it kind of relates to what we're talking about, is just kind of being in lockdown and quarantine and maybe letting the days get the best of us sometimes. But, you know, what kind of inspired you about him when you saw his story? I'll tell you what inspired me was, first of all, I was having a bad day. I was just having a rough day. And like an idiot, I'm looking at the news. <laughs> <laughs> that's not making me feel any better. And I couldn't get going. I couldn't do writing. I couldn't do anything. And I got an email from Debbie Siegel, one of our board members, one of our terrific board members at differentbrains.org. And Debbie sent me this article. And I read this article. And it just made my day. It made my day. It made me feel so good that it inspired me, forget your writer's block, let's write an article about this. Yeah. And write about how this guy, this young man who'd been in a wheelchair his whole life, was graduating high school and Hunter Whitrock was determined he was going to walk across that stage and get his diploma. And he worked hard, he worked in secret a lot, he didn't let a lot of people know. And then came time for graduation. He's working with therapists. He's busting himself to do it. Coronavirus comes along and they say, hey, we're not going to have a graduation. And then right before graduation, the school decided to have it and they were allowed to do it. And he got up and he walked across that stage. And I read this story and it just inspired me and it made me feel good. And I thought, You know, let me share that with other people, not just the story, but this is a tool. This is a tool we can all use. We're under the weather with this coronavirus thing. Look at what was probably happening in my brain, physiologically, anatomically, chemically. Yeah. You know, the happy dopa and, you know, (laughs) everything was running around. All those neurotransmitters. All those neurotransmitters. (laughs) Yeah. Wacky. And it felt good. And I got, and then I parlayed on it. Then I got a good workout in. And I ate a good healthy meal. And I went outside and went for a walk and got some fresh air. And then I did a Zoom call with somebody nice like you. Mm. And it's all good. And to me, it all connected. And that's why I wrote that article. Yeah. Yeah, I know, because I do a lot of writing for myself and for people that pay me that don't have time to write. And, and, and I think writing is one of those things that if you're not in the mood, um, it, nothing good is going to come of it, <laughs> you know? And then all of a sudden, like you say, something just hits you and you're like, boom, all of a sudden you're just, yeah. the, the, the keyboard is flying. And so, so, so I got a question and we obviously, I don't know if we know this or not, but just from your experience in the world of different brains is that, you know, he trained for several months. That's what I, what I saw to to do this. Do you think he did that for himself or do you think he did that to maybe inspire others a little bit of both? What do you, what do you, what do you think? I know we don't really know, but. I think it was both. And I think it's something I try to teach the kids at the boys and girls club of Broward County too. Don't buy society's big lie that those things are mutually exclusive, Mm -hmm. right? If you want to do something good for yourself, that also helps other people. And then if you talk about careers, if you want to get a career where you love doing something and you're going to make a good living at it to support your family and your loved ones, and it's going to help other people, that's the trifecta. There you go. And if you can do that, then you're, you're really, really doing good. Um, it, so many times in society, well-meaning thinks that these things are different, but they don't have to be. Mm-hmm. And a lot of jobs that I've had, like when I was a doctor, for instance, when I was an orthopedic surgeon for all those many years, I, I was doing what I loved doing. I was helping a lot of people, 
I was making a good living to support my family and help the community and do what I could. And the part that often gets lost is something my mother taught me when she was pumping gas at the family gas station in Jersey City. You have a moral obligation to work up to your full potential with the gifts that God gave you to help yourself, your family, your friends, and those less fortunate and have a good time doing it. Mm -hmm. That's the part that often gets lost. I see all the good stuff you do and you love doing it. And it makes you feel good. And you have a gift to do that, you know? And that's win, win, win all the way around. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. And it's, uh, you know, the, there's, I, I live in two worlds at the moment. So where I still have clients in the kind of marketing space. <laughs> And I'm grateful for that, but there's, there are demands and there are back and forths and, oh, I didn't like this or so redo that. Okay. It's just part of the world, you know, and then somebody writes a great um, uh, uh, review on iTunes saying that I, I found your podcast and it really helped me sort out some things. And I'm sure you see that all the time, but you know, that, is I'm not doing it to, you know, you know, because I need praise. Okay. But when you see those things, it's like, okay, what I'm doing is really helping. And it does, it, it, it puts a kind of a, a fire under you. Well, it makes you feel good and it makes them feel good. And that's what it's all about. I used to think of drastic situations, imaginary situations, where people who really, really, really had to sacrifice for somebody else. Yeah. And I've asked that same question you just asked. Is it, you asked it in different words, but is it for themselves or for the other person? Is it selfish or is it generous? And I maintain, and let's take a radical example. Say you were a mother during the Holocaust and the, the, the soldier says to you, we're either gonna kill your kid or you cut off your right arm. And you say, I'm gonna cut off my right arm. That's a selfish decision because I'd rather lose my arm than lose my child. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that sounds like a, a silly example. It, it probably is in many ways, but when you do nice things, you're really helping yourself and you're helping the greater good and everything. And I like to, I like to see things as win, win, win all the way around. Mm -hmm. if I can. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a good way of putting it. What do you think? Um, what do you think stories like hunters and others? Cause we, we have seen these before. Okay. Uh, but what do you think that says about uh, mindset, maybe tiny habits, uh, determination? Because he didn't just go to the gym once and learn how to stand up and walk. Okay, that was, that was a daily thing. I mean, and I think a lot of us have trouble, and I'll throw myself under the bus too. Um, you know, a lot of us have trouble sticking to even those little habits you know it's like james clear's you know book you know uh, atomic habits where he's just like just get 10 percent better every day okay but what, what do you think that says about people their their willingness to to, to do those types of things i say, i think it says a lot about character like hunter's yeah. character yeah. and he was so diligent and was going to do this no matter what it took and the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step it's easy to stay when you don't have a thousand miles to go and you can't take that first step even. Yeah. And in, in my life, one of the best compliments I ever got about work ethic was at the old Fifth Street gym in Miami where I used to box out of. And I had 26 pro heavyweight fights and I was older than everybody and I was the smallest heavyweight in captivity. <laughs> and the compliments I used to get by when I had a 10 round fight coming up and I'd be working so hard, there's nobody outworks the doc. Nobody outworks me. Mm -hmm. Hard work is a, it's a privilege and it's great to be able to do it. 
And it's great to have something that's so important to you that you're going to do that. And I really admire Hunter because that was hard, hard, hard stuff. That was hard to even think of doing it when it's so far in the distance. And what it says about him is he's got character. Yeah. He's got character. And this revealed his character. It didn't make his character. It revealed his character. Revealed who he really was. Yeah. 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 What, uh, what did you learn from boxing in this, in, in our current, you know, topic of discussion? What did you learn from boxing? Um, I learned, it's funny because I just had a conversation about this with a, a, a good friend of mine who's, who's a very unique individual, Professor Gordon Marino at St. Olaf's up in Minnesota. He's a professor of existentialism and philosophy mm. and the curator of the Kierkegaard Library. Wow. He's also a boxing writer and a boxing trainer. And we were talking about in existentialism, which is the absurdity of life. The, the story I think of is the myth of Sisyphus. And his punishment was he had to roll this boulder all the way up this big, big hill and then let it roll down. Then he had to go back down and roll the boulder back up for all of eternity. Yeah. And this is what Camus and others have called the absurdity of life kind of thing is my limited understanding because I'm not a not a philosopher and I was just saying to uh, Gordon that one of the another big compliment I got when I was boxing and I had a record of 13 wins seven losses and six draws and I had knocked people out I never got counted out but I did have fights stopped. And one of the ways a fight gets stopped is if the three knockdown rule is in effect. And there were a couple of fights where I was getting knocked down so many times, they just, they stopped the fight. But what Gordon Marino wrote was, what if there were no three knockdown rule? Okay. Oh. And you keep getting up and you do your best and then you get knocked down again and you keep getting up and for all of eternity, you know, kind of thing. Right. And, um, so many things I've learned from boxing. I'm writing a book now called um, Boxing as a Metaphor for Life, which is not about boxing really, but it's about all the things I've learned um, from some of my heroes, but just experiences. Because, you know, in many ways, um, to me anyway, I don't recommend anybody – do any violent sport where you get hit in the head or you get beat up or, you know, football or UFC or any of that stuff. Right. Um, but for me, it was, it was good, but it, cause it was, it was clear cut. In other words, it was pure. The guy in the ring is going to try to knock you out and you're going to try to knock him out. There's no make believe rules. And when you, when the referee gets in the middle of the ring, he tells you all these rules, no hitting here, no hitting there, no hitting below the belt. But the last thing he says, which is a real metaphor for life and something this coronavirus thing has taught us, the last thing he says when you go back to that corner, protect yourself at all times. Mm. Yeah, these are the rules, but there are no rules. Right. You got to be prepared. Coronavirus came, do your thing. You got to do your best. This yeah. wasn't in the cards. This wasn't in the books. And month after month goes by. So I say to you and your listeners, easy for me to say, but do your best. Turn it into a positive, right? Yeah. Start your own podcast. Go ahead. Do what you can do. And yeah. do what you can do to help other people like you do. Yeah, write that book, write that book blog posts, start that side hustle. Uh, you hate your job, take a step back, be methodical about it, decide what you want to do next, start that business you've always wanted to do. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a perfect opportunity to, to clear your head, you know, because you're right. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. We don't know if 
I mean, you know, you and I are talking in July. There's already, a, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's considered the second wave, but cases are going back up in certain states. So we don't know what's happening. So yeah, I mean, you're right. You got to kind of, and I think some people, and, I, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll single out those with ADHD. Sometimes the ADHD brain does have a hard time doing that. While in some cases we can be impulsive, other times we have a hard time kind of making that next step. So I think it's important for people to be inspired in some way, you know, through your work and, and other people. You know, it's interesting. I'm uh, interviewing in a couple of weeks, Alicia Doyle. Are you familiar with Alicia Doyle? No, I'm ignorant. Uh, she's a um, uh, two-time uh, uh, Golden Gloves champion. So, um, and we're going to talk about her journey as well um, through boxing. So podcast really has nothing to do with ADHD, but I think it's, you know, as you said, there, there's certain things you can learn from boxing and other things in life. So, so I'm really excited to kind of chat about that. So um, about ADHD, I just want to say one of our interns, Ali Idris, who's in his third year of college and wants to uh, become a doctor, um, great self-advocate. And um, I'm helping him with two projects but he's doing the heavy lifting, which is to write a book about ADHD from his perspective that gives real tools how to help. And he's um, uh, starting a webisode series on different brains with Brooke Schnittman, who's an executive coach and an ADHD coach mm -hmm. uh, for just two minute webisodes of tips and tools. See, I'm very big on tools you can use. That's why I wrote the book, Asper Tools. Right. You know, what can we really do? And what you find is, is that the tools that work for one neurodiversity work for all of them, okay? But all of them are in all these different silos where nobody communicates with each other. But all of the things we think is good, are good for Asperger's or autism are also good for ADHD, are also good for PTSD, also good for depression, also good for Parkinson's disease, not because it's magical and they really don't cost anything, but you, you got to do it and you got to have a full dance card. And again, it's not brain surgery, but it's a lot of it is a positive attitude, not a blow sunshine up your behind positive. Right. Yeah. What are the tools I can use? How am I going to make myself feel good today? Come on, yeah. It's a beautiful day out there. Can't you go out and get some fresh air? Don't you have time in your day? You know, do it. Do yeah. it. Yeah. No, I think, I, I think you're right. I think there's, you know, I mean, I guess to be specific, executive functions, where if you have an ADHD diagnosis or an autism diagnosis, I think some of the same strategies could be implemented to help somebody say, get through math class or or get that to-do list done for their boss or show up on time you know <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah. Listen, no matter what your neurodiversity a calendar will help you okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly and some of us fail to do that i just did a uh, i just did a podcast last week on being time blind which whether you have add or not <laughs> like, that's, that's on steroids in coronavirus times i mean yeah forget about it oh yeah yeah like a so, week ago or a year ago you know uh, yeah exactly and i think when you all of a sudden maybe you were uh in an office setting and now you're you're back at home the kids school is closed you had to set up an office space um where you weren't working before you got to make sure the kid gets on the zoom call for history or or civics or or math or what have you, and I you know they're not used to it. And then throw in, I know we're getting off track here, but throw in the throw in the different brain category. And I have some very recent experience with this where you know the, the kids in special education have um, have really lost an an enormous amount of of traction the past four months. You know, you you got a you got a student who has an aid in class, so they have other accommodations, and that's gone. So, 
you know, now, now the parent is the aide. I'm not a trained ABA therapist or anything. I mean, I, I, so it's, uh, tough stuff. It's tough stuff. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. You yeah, gotta get, uh, telehelp. <laughs> it's, you know, we're all learning how to utilize these, uh, um, these techniques like we're on now on a zoom call. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. uh, Another thing we're doing at Different Brains is we're going to have our first ever World Neurodiversity Conference because it's virtual world now. So now I don't have to worry about the enormous expense of trying to do this or flying people in or getting a hotel and all this. No, it's, you know, if Temple Grandin is nice enough to join us, she'll be sitting at her computer. Just like us, yeah. Yeah. Like us, you know? yeah. Did you see, uh, I saw Tony Robbins posted some pictures of uh, one of his, you know, if you've ever seen his events there, oh, you know, this is huge, you know, but he recreated that and I mean, it literally looked like a television studio set in whatever room, probably in his mansion in Fiji or something. But I mean, he had multiple cameras and he had, I mean, and he recreated that online, the, the, the energy. It was, it was amazing that, uh, how we actually did that rather than just sitting here with a webcam, you know, he really, he did it right. So it was interesting. So, so let's get back to these kind of stories and, you know, um, why do you think we need these stories? In our lives, I know we touched on it a little bit, but well, you know. throughout history, throughout history, storytelling has been a very, very powerful thing. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was how history was relayed from one generation to the other. I mean, if you go back to Socrates and those guys hanging around Greece, you know, those people talking on a street corner, you know, the printing press didn't come along to whatever year it was, and not, not that good with numbers, but. Uh, and now you have the whole digital revolution, okay, which is turning everything on, but it all comes down to stories and relationships. What's your story? You know, what makes this good? And uh, uh, I think that the power of story is gaining more during these times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How would you advise somebody in these times, challenging times, to kind of create these stories for themselves? How do you, how do, you do that? Well, I'm no expert, but I can tell you something my daughter Rebecca taught me. My daughter gave me a challenge. We have this, my daughter and I and uh, special ed teacher Patty Fasano and her, her son Nick, we kind of give each other goals and challenges. And one of the goals was because I was having writer's block going back a little while. And one of my goals was every day I have to write freestyle one to two pages and send it to her. Mm -hmm. And it, it broke my writer's block. And I was, because freestyle meant whatever I wanted to write about. So I didn't have to do any one thing. And it was a tool that I would never have thought of to do. And I'm doing it every day now. Now I'm writing more. I started working on a couple of books. I'm working on a couple of screen, more screenplays and stuff. And it's uh, really turned on my brain. And I'm sure if I were to have a, you know, dynamic MRI, <laughs> there would be a lot of stuff going on that wasn't going on before. Because yeah. I'm using that. Yeah. And um, um, so, I think that I think that you have to be a little bit creative, and as with all things, you have to know the individual too, because, like, if you've met one Aspie, you've met one Aspie. If you met one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD. One of our uh, former interns who now has a great job with Comcast and has been promoted several times, and there's other companies going, going after him. He has severe ADHD and OCD. And I used to tease him when he was with us. Will you tell your OCD to kick the stuffing out of your ADHD so you can get this done? Please. Let's do it. So are, are you, I mean, a lot of people talk about journaling. Where, I mean, is that, is that the equivalent of journaling is what you're doing now? Just kind no, of. No, what I'm doing now is different and I'd never heard of it before. 
And my daughter said, freestyle. And I said, what does that mean? She said, you just do whatever you want. Just got to be one to two pages. Mm. So when I sit there, when something happens to me that I feel like writing about, that's what I write about for the day, you know? For instance, um, uh, yesterday, um, I, I saw a yellow pad and I thought about and so I wrote the I wrote the freestyle on this, how when I would get stuck on a scene when I was writing the Square Root of Two movie starring Darby Stansfield from Scandal, when I was writing, writing that, when I would get stuck on a scene, I would stop typing it. And then what I would do is I would get out a yellow pad and handwrite it. And then I would get my iPhone out and I would dictate it and then send it to the computer and have the computer type it. And then I'd look at all three and guess what? There were three different scenes. Really? They use different parts of your brain. When you oh. handwrite, when you type, when you talk, different, different parts of your brain are lighting up, different parts. And it gives you actually a different perspective within. So I wrote about that and I hand wrote it on a yellow pad and sent it, and my daughter didn't accept it because it has to be on a Word document. So then I had to, had to type it on. So it was ironic, but you see, it gets your brain to go to interesting places, you know? See, that's, that's interesting because I've tried, like, dictation software, yeah. and, and I'm an awful typer. I mean, I'm, I'm literally what they call, the, you know, the hunting pack, and, and I write for a living. I, you know, I wrote a book. I'm on the second book. Okay. I got to write a lot like you do. Okay. But, and, and I know people like attorneys and what have you that dictate into, and, and maybe it doesn't have to be smooth. It just needs to be words, but I, I can't, I, I gotta, there's a connection between the brain and the keyboard that, that doesn't happen when I, I dictate. Try this if you'd like, and I'm not recommending one form over another. I do them all. It's, it's interesting because you have to do what works for you. And um, I work with one screenwriter, Steve Greenberg, and he's still, he's still like this on an old typewriter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is I got one of these old J.C. Smith Corona. And the thing's got to be 120 years old over here. It's just, you know, yeah. so my wife collects typewriters, so... Um, so as we wrap up, when you read uh, Hunter's story, it caused you to pause. Would that be an accurate assessment? Yes. Yes, yeah. it did. Similar to how a mindfulness thing would have forced me to recalibrate, you know? Yeah. In other words, it stopped me in my tracks. Yeah. It stopped me and I paused. And I said, look at what this young man did. Look how hard he worked. Look how he had a goal. And look how happy I am because he did it. He walked for the first time. He got his diploma. And boy, oh boy, what's better than that? And yeah, it's exhilarating. Yeah. Why is it important for us to, to, to pause? I mean, we're just, it, it, it's funny because a lot of us are working from home. And we actually haven't been able to pause. We haven't been able to take a vacation. We, we actually, some of us might actually be busier than ever, just given our circumstances now. And, and I think some of us are getting tired. So, um, I, I mean, I know some of us are out of work and we see all the, the videos online of people being bored <laughs> doing stuff in a house. And I understand that too. Okay. But for the people who, are just starting to get tired. Why is it important for us to pause? It's important for you to pause in the same way it's important for you to reboot your computer once in a while. You got to let your brain reboot, okay? And I don't mean this, I don't mean to sound like a know-it-all by anything, any means. I'll just tell you some of the tools that work for me. If I don't do a, like five or 10 minutes of mindfulness and some breathing with you know, you can use any app you want, Headspace, you can use 10% Happy, it doesn't matter. Or you can just stop, like my friend Ed Harold, who I spoke with out in uh, the Aspen Institute, just to take some deep breaths 
in and out. Just to do that, what it does is it gets your parasympathetic system working, it slows you down, and it makes you just stop to. And then if you combine that with say, well, I'm going to stand up now too, while I'm talking to David, take a deep breath, I'm going to sit back down. And if I do that for a couple of minutes, I have found that to be a very good tool. If you want to talk about specific tools, and to just to break the cycle, when you got something running around and around in your head, and you got to break the cycle. I also find a great tool to use if I'm, if I'm hitting the wall with anything or I'm not feeling right, I'll go get a good workout, half hour to one hour, 30 to yeah. 60 minutes, okay? Yeah. All the studies now show if you walk briskly for 30 minutes, not only is it a great reset, not only do you breathe, not only do you get fresh air, not only does it cheer you up and everything, but every way you can measure it, you improve your health, and not only in your brain, you improve your overall health with cancer, diabetes, heart disease, anything, as much as a very intense super duper workout. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've been doing a, a lot lately. And, you know, because the gyms were closed and they're opening up and I'm not sure if I'm ready to go back. Opening up and I'm chicken to go. So but we made a little gym in the garage here. and Yeah. I mean, I have asthma. Um, so I'm not really interested in, in, and that was my, an hour a day, you know, four, four times a week. That was my escape. I have a hard time working out in my garage. I've got dumbbells. I've got stuff for some reason. It's just, it's, no, it's, it's, hard. It's, it, hard. it's hard, but I haven't taken an hour walk, you know, a few nights a week. Really? And, yeah. I mean, and, and go fast. And then and I get frustrated because the slow people in front of me. <laughs> President Harry Truman said, but you have to walk like you got to get somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, anyway. Let me tell you something positive about having asthma, okay? Is that just today, um, I was reading uh, some of the doctors are really talking about how great the asthma inhalers are for coronavirus if you start to get sick. Anything in the, you know, the glucosteroids, the glucocorticoids kind of thing. Yeah. And your body and brain are already used to that. Mm -hmm. and this is all an immunological phenomenon. It's really more of what your respiratory system and whole body does in reaction to the foreign invader. Okay. Yeah. And then it's actually the inflammatory autoimmune response that goes overboard. And your body is kind of used to battling that with the asthma. So, uh, you know, you might actually, even though I'm reading otherwise, I don't know that there've been real studies. Um, you know, the average Joe on the street, if I get it and I get respiratory problems, I'm not going to be reaching for my inhaler so quick. And, yeah. Yeah, I should. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good, uh, that's a good point is that, that, yeah, we are used to, at least a lot of us are used to taking care of our lungs and respiratory system. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So and we have to do whatever we can to reduce our stress. Cause when, when you're under stress, you're using that part of the brain and body that's fight or flight, you know, you're getting ready for everything, but if you're under stress, it's always, you're always making that cortisol and you're always on high alert and it's not good for you because it interferes with so many things. No. And it's, and it's exhausting. You know, I said to my wife and, and I'm actually not kidding. Like the first couple months of the coronavirus thing, it's just, you know, you get to the end of the day and like my face hurt, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like I, my face is tired. You know, I, I can't explain it. <laughs> But that's the way my body reacted. I'm like, I'll throw cold water in my face. It's just something just to kind of, all right, snap out of it. So, anywho, thank you again, sir. Um, tell people how they can find you. David, it's always a pleasure. Keep up the great work you do. And uh, stay positive. Wash your hands. Go for a walk. <laughs> Keep doing all the good stuff you're doing. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank you, sir. All right, we'll see you soon. That's a wrap, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging out with us and hanging out to the end of the podcast. I hope you've been able to take away something from our expert guests that you can implement in your life and your business. 
and I value each and every one of you. If you like what you hear in the podcast, you like the experts that I have every week on the podcast, I'd love for you to hop on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform and tell us what you think. Give me a positive review. It helps reach more people. If you want to learn more about me, you can go to overcomingdistractions.com. There you can find all the past podcast episodes. You can find a copy of the book where you can get a link to Amazon or Barnes & Noble. So until next time, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.